Hi there, it's Sarah here from BJC Health coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, thanks for showing an interest in one of our educational events. You're about to watch part one. Um, so enjoy the event. If you've got any questions about the content, then please consider joining BJC Connect where you can access all of our facilitators live. Um, otherwise, please consider leaving a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so I'll be speaking about menopause. All right, let's get started. So just an overview about what we're going to discuss. So firstly, what exactly is menopause um, and why does it occur? What are the consequences of menopause and why should we really care? And how to manage this phase of your life. So just starting off with um, some definitions and characteristics of menopause. So we're on the same page using the same terminology. Um, so menopause is defined as the last menstrual period, but of course knowing which will be your last menstrual period can only be done in retrospect. Um, but you may be, become aware that you are around that time of menopause or what we call perimenopause. As in the lead up to this, your periods can become um, consistently irregular in their timing and uh, you may start to experience some of the menopausal symptoms. This can occur several years before that last period um, and it also includes the 12 months uh, after that last period. Once you're past this 12 months, you're considered to be in the postmenopausal phase. Um, this definition that we currently have is a bit limited because it relies on you having periods, which doesn't apply to women who don't have a uterus or um, those that are on contraception that render them without regular periods. But this is what we're dealing with at the moment. And why does this occur? Well, there's um, a decrease in est estrogen that's produced from the ovaries and the estrogen deficiency is what predominantly leads to these symptoms. It typically occurs at an average age of 51 years old, but ranges from 45 to 55. Early menopause is when it occurs between 40 and 45 years of age. And if it occurs when you're under, 50, uh, under 40, sorry, it's termed premature menopause or primary ovarian insufficiency. So just digging a bit deeper into what's going on, um, just to explain the uh, underlying concepts. During, um, whilst a female is in utero, she is developing her ovaries and her eggs and actually she reaches about a peak of 7 million eggs. These start to decline even before birth and by the time a female is born, she'll have about 1 to 2 million eggs. It continues to decline and by puberty, there'll be about 300 to 400,000 eggs. And over the course of a woman's reproductive lifespan, there are 400 to 500 eggs that are recruited for each cycle. Sorry, they were recruited um, for menstruation. And for each cycle of menstruation, a thousand eggs are lost per cycle. So that by the time you get to menopause, the number's down to about a thousand. And just getting a bit further into what's happening, these um these pictures are taken from an endocrinology textbook, so um, they are quite detailed, but I just want to give you an appreciation of what's happening. Um, so the hypothalamus is in the brain and it signals a hormone to the pituitary gland, which is a master gland in the brain, uh, controls a number of other hormonal glands in the body. And it signals to the ovaries to then produce estrogen and progesterone. And this gives rise to the maturation of an egg and ovulation and preparation of the endometrium to receive that egg. And if that doesn't happen, that's when we have a period. And this cycle um, of hormones is what leads to the regular cycle of the periods. However, when the ovarian reserve declines, then the estrogen output also declines and this gives a, a feedback to the pituitary that it needs to try to drive up its stimulatory hormones in order to try to get the ovary to produce more estrogen. 
And it's when this starts to happen that the hormones start to become more variable. And eventually, as the ovarian reserve continues to decline, there is an insufficient output of estrogen. And this is what leads to all the symptoms. So early in menopause, because of that fluctuation in the hormone levels, um, the estrogen levels can be high or low, but with time, the estrogen levels decline and the symptoms favour that of estrogen deficiency. So we're probably very familiar with the common symptoms of hot flashes, but there are estrogen receptors all over the body. So there's a myriad of symptoms that can uh, that are actually caused by menopause that sometimes people don't realise. So there's mood changes, sleep disturbance, fatigue, low libido, urinary and vaginal symptoms, joint and muscle aches, forgetfulness, brain fro fog, trouble concentrating. And then with the estrogen excess, um, you may experience breast pain or heavy menstrual bleeding um, and headaches. So things that um, contribute to the age of onset of menopause, uh, genetics plays a large role. So getting an idea from your mother, aunt, sisters when they went through menopause can give you an idea as well. Smoking <clears throat> reduces the age of menopause. Alcohol, for some reason, has an association with an uh, uh, increased age of menopause. The oral contraceptive pill is not thought to, to affect the age of menopause. And an early age of when you had your first period um, makes your menopause age usually a little bit lower. And that's because as we discussed with every period, there's a large loss of the egg reserve. And so if you start your periods earlier, you bring uh, the menopause age forward. The number of pregnancies has been associated with the age of menopause, uh, potentially because whilst you're pregnant, you're putting the, you know, your regular um ovulation on hold and therefore delaying that age to menopause. Diet may affect your age of menopause <clears throat> with uh, an increase in unsaturated fat reducing the age and fruit and protein intake de delaying the age. And uh, it would seem that a higher BMI results in a higher age of onset of menopause. So menopause is a clinical diagnosis. It's based on the menstrual irreg irregularity that we talked about uh, occurring at the appropriate age with or without the associated symptoms. Testing is only required if the diagnosis is in doubt and it's usually testing of the hormone levels. Um, so this may occur if menopause is occurring earlier than expected or the symptoms may be concerning for another diagnosis. Apart from the reproductive aspects and symptoms of estrogen deficiency that is associated with menopause, it's important to be aware that there are other health changes occurring um, during and then ongoing after this time. So this includes acceleration of bone loss, which increases risk of osteoporosis. One in two, so 50% of postmenopausal women will have an osteoporotic fracture in their lifetime. Uh, this is more than double that of men. An average woman loses up to 10% of her bone mass in the first five years after menopause. And the risk of hip fracture will increase with age and women are twice as likely to sustain a hip fracture, which uh, is definitely not a benign thing as uh, experiencing your first hip fracture after the age of 45 is associated with significant mortality of 8.5% at one month, 15% uh, at 30 days, sorry, 50%, 15, 15% at 90 days, and 26%, uh, that's a quarter, at one year. There is also a change in the body composition and the distribution of weight, favoring um, the more central abdominal area rather than the estrogen dependent areas of the hips and buttocks. Um, and central adiposity um, is more associated with visceral fat, which is the more toxic um, uh, 
more to toxic fat. Um, there's also a change in the cholesterol levels and the way we process lipids, um, where uh, if you get your cholesterol checked at this time, you'll, you'll usually find that the, the, bad, the bad fats or the bad cholesterol is higher. And these tend to um, be the ones that form plaques in the blood vessels. Um, there's also a way, uh, a change in the way that we process glucose. Um, we're not able to tolerate large glucose loads and there's an increase in insulin resistance. Um, so what that means is normally sugar or carbohydrates that are broken down by the body into sugar and absorbed by the gut into the blood makes its way into the cells using insulin produced by the pancreas, and that gets used for energy or stored away for fat. But with the increased insulin resistance, um, it's difficult for well, the, the body doesn't respond as normally to insulin and glucose is not moving as readily as readily from the blood to the cells. Um, so, and glucose in the blood is, has a damaging effect and the insulin resistance can lead to diabetes. So this all together can increase your cardiovascular risk. Um, and unfortunately, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women, uh, even though it's typically thought of to be associated with men. Mood disorders um, increases in incidence, especially for women who have a history of hormone-related mood symptoms. And whilst um, the onset of menopause does not cause cancer, um, it's important that we are conscious of it because several screening programs start around this age of life, um, including bowel and breast cancer. Survival cool cancer screening should be ongoing. And the health measures that we take to improve our general health also um, can lower cancer risk. So that being said, there are preventative steps and lifestyle measures that can be taken to address these health concerns at not only at this time, but ongoing um, for a lifelong um, time. Um, although menopause does not uh, strictly cause weight gain, as I mentioned, there's a change in the distribution of weight. Um, and it's uh, there's evidence to suggest that weight gain can increase the severity of menopausal symptoms, such as hot flushes. Um, so it's helpful to at least maintain weight. Aerobic exercise um, is important for cardiovascular health, mood, um, reducing mortality, quality of life, cognitive function, sleep patterns, so many aspects of day-to-day -day function. Um, and it's recommended to get about 30 minutes of moderate exercise on most days or half of that if you're doing vigorous exercise. As part of the aging and menopause process, there is a loss of muscle mass which over time can contribute to frailty and increased mortality. I mean, I'm sure we all want to be that older lady who's running around keeping up with their grandkids and traveling and, um, you know, enjoying their hobbies and not um, cooped up in a nursing home on a walker falling over. Um, so resistance training is important to incorporate as, incorporate as well. Um, it improves your lean mass, bone health, sorry, lean mass and bone health. And a higher muscle mass also results in a higher basal metabolic rate. Um, muscle is more metabolic active and will burn more calories without doing anything compared to fat. Uh, flexibility and balance is also important to reduce falls risks. Um, and that's the primary concern when we're um, thinking about osteoporosis and fractures. Whilst there's no specific form, uh, there's no specific menopause diet, um, there are principles that we can employ that um, target the change in me metabolism and the health risks um, associated with menopause. Um, so these include prioritizing whole foods and avoiding processed or overly processed discretionary foods, which are those that are very calorie dense, but don't offer that much nutrition. They're usually expensive um, and they're, you know, ma manufactured to make you um, overeat, even though they may be marketed as healthy. 
Um, so ensuring that your meals are well uh, compositioned, that the carbohydrates you have are preferably low GI because um, they're broken down more slowly and avoid those glucose spikes, which as we mentioned, our bodies don't tolerate as well at this time. Um, including protein with every meal. Quite often breakfast is a bit neglected here. Often I hear people just having toast with butter or some wheat bix. Um, protein can help um, improve your satiety, slow down the digestion of the carbohydrates um, and uh, contribute to healthy muscle. Um, similarly, it's important to include enough fiber in your diet. That's important for your gut microbiome, which can then improve your um, glucose tolerance, your cholesterol and your cardiovascular health. Um, calcium is also important. So um, 1,000 milligrams is good enough for maintenance as an adult. However, in the postmenopausal phase, the absorption of calcium from the gut is not as good. So it's recommended to have a little bit more, 1300 milligrams, which amounts to about three or four serves of dairy. Um, if you can't tolerate that, other sources um, would be tofu, snapper, canned sardines, tuna, egg, beans, nuts, um, for more detailed information on how much, exactly how much is in each different um, food type, you can see the Healthy Bones Australia website. They also have recipes on there. Um, if you need to, um, you can't, and you can't quite meet these requirements through your diet, you can supplement it. Um, and I often hear people tell me they don't eat much calcium, but it's fine because their calcium levels on their blood tests are normal. Um, but the thing to be aware of there is that like a lot of things in the body, um, the calcium is kept within a tight range and it's also modulated by hormones. Um, so if you're not getting enough calcium from your diet and absorbing it from your gut to sustain that, it, get, it gets taken from your main store of calcium, which is your bones. So it'll be leaching out of your bones and that's what can contribute to osteoporosis. Um, and calcium in the blood is very important for um, muscle function, including the heart. Um, vitamin D is also an important part of bone health, which is uh, we get from healthy sun exposure. And if that's not enough, um, supplementation is also required. I'll just make a, a special mention to contraception because um, we often associate menopause with the, the loss of fertility, but there is still a risk of pregnancy until you reach that 12 months after menopause or a little bit longer, two years, if your menopause has occurred under 50 years of age. So don't forget to um, uh, remember contraception and uh, your needs and re recommended options may change at this time. So um, if you're not sure what to do there, speak to your health professional. So now we get into um, how do we manage um, the symptoms of menopause. Uh, so firstly, hot flushes, they arise from the alteration to the thermoregulatory centre. Um, so some things we can do to manage our experience of hot flushes um, can adjust the room temperature, carry a fan, have a cool drink on hand, dress in layers that can be easily removed and wear breathable fabrics. Um, there are some identifiable triggers such as spicy foods, alcohol, smoking. Uh, we've already mentioned the benefits of exercise. And there are some, um, you know, cognitive practices um, that can be employed, such as yoga, breathing, cognitive behaviour therapy. Uh, there's limited evidence for hypnosis, not really much good evidence for acupuncture, ac acupuncture magnetic therapy, reflexology or um, chiropractic practices. Uh, sleep disturbance is quite common. It's from the changing hormone levels as well, but there are other factors that can exacerbate this with the hot flushes and sweating, mood disorders, um, lifestyle factors, and poor sleep can increase your appetite, um, affects your glucose tolerance, 
negatively affects your food choices and can affect your physical and cognitive performance. Um, and sleep duration that's less than seven hours a, of a night, um, as well as fragmented sleep, can um, be associated with an increased mortality, um, as well as linked to cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, diabetes, and mood disorders. So it's important to have good sleep hygiene, which means having a cool, dark, quiet environment, a comfortable bed with breathable sheets, excuse me, um, a regular sleep time, avoiding excess stimulus close to bedtime, such as caffeine and vigorous exercise. Um, and whilst alcohol may help with the onset of sleep, usually the, the sleep quality is quite poor and can be quite fragmented and um, metabolism of alcohol can change at this time of life as well. Um, some, uh, if there's any underlying sleep disorders, those should be addressed and cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful here as well. So um, the loss of estrogen um, stimulation on the vaginal tissue causes it causes it to become thin and lose its elasticity. The tissue contracts, exposing sensitive areas. Uh, there's also loss of the lubrication, um, resulting in dryness. And all this can result in chafing and tearing, itching. Sexual intercourse can become more painful. The vagina is also naturally acidic, and that's designed to protect from infections. It becomes more alkaline um, during menopause and after menopause, which can um, lead to frequent urinary tract infections and um, pers a persistent malodorous discharge. Uh, additionally, pelvic floor mus muscles um, can become weak and uh, women may experience um, frequent the frequent need to urinate and difficulty in controlling urination. Um, so in order to manage this, try to reduce the um, number of irritants, um, wearing uh, um, hypoallergenetic underwear and using um, low aller allergy washes. Um, a cool wash with dilute bicarb soda can be helpful for itching and using vaginal moisturizers or lubricants um, can be helpful for the dryness. Um, pelvic floor exercises can be helpful, which you may be able to find all online or with the help of a um, women's health physiotherapist. Um, so there's, oh, sorry, there's also um, reduced libido. Um, and this actually correlates, the decline in sexual function correlates more with falling estradiol, not with testosterone. Um, I haven't really talked much about testosterone, but this actually declines from your mid twenties and reaches about half the level by your forties, but the levels have not been found to correlate with someone's sexual function. And um, so you may want to review the various stresses on your life, on your relationship, workplace um, stresses and busy lifestyles, um, which can contribute to fatigue, but there are also medical causes of fatigue like iron deficiency or thyroid dysfunction that should be addressed. Um, your mood can obviously contribute to this. And if necessary, you might want to seek help, help from a psychologist. So now we'll get down to hormone therapy, which is given just to replace those low levels of, um, of hormones that's causing all these symptoms, primarily estrogen, which is the most effective for treating all these symptoms. Um, but the other considerations um, on what kind of hormone therapy you might need include whether you have a uterus. Um, you would need to have progesterone if you have a uterus because having estrogen on its own will constantly stimulate the endometrium, causing it to grow and potentially become um, abnormal and a risk for cancer. So having progesterone uh, stops this effect. Um, and then whether the hormone therapy is given on a cyclical basis or continuously uh, depends where um, you are in your uh, menopause timeline. If it's within 12 months from your last period, 
you will receive cyclical therapy, which will result in um, regular withdrawal bleeds, uh, similar to the oral contraceptive pill. Um, whereas if you're in established menopause after 12 months, you'll, uh, 12 months after your last period, um, you'll have continuous therapy where both estrogen and progesterone are just given constantly and there shouldn't be any bleeding. Um, and the reason for that, you might wonder, um, you know, why do you have to have the bleed if you're close to menopause? Um, and that's because the endometrium hasn't, um, I guess, regressed and become thin enough like it would in established menopause. And giving continuous therapy in that setting might um, uh, will produce um, breakthrough bleeding, which can be um, a bit of a nuisance. Um, and so the different ways that hormone therapy is given, it can be given as combination estrogen and progesterone in a tablet um, combined in a patch, although I will say there's a shortage of the patch at the moment. Um, estrogen can also be given as a gel and the progesterone be given as a tablet separately or um, through the Mirena. Um, and all those factors contribute to what kind of hormone therapy you would be recommended. The benefits of hormone therapy are far reaching. So not only does it very effectively address a lot of the symptoms we've discussed, it improves your bone health and reduces fracture risk, um, provides protection from coronary heart disease if it started uh, close to menopause and premature death, as well as improved quality of life. We've just finished watching part one of one of our recent educational events. Hope you enjoyed the content. If you'd like to access part two, then you need to sign up for BJC Connect. It's a free platform where you can access not just the recordings of uh, past events, but also access a whole range of upcoming future events and access our team of facilitators live. Um, all of the details that you need to join VDC Connected now flashing up on your screen. But otherwise, like our staff, subscribe if you'd like to see more information from VJC Health. Look forward to seeing you in an event soon.